Good afternoon and welcome. I am Melanie Ramey, the chair of the board of the Madison Committee on Foreign Relations. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon, as many of you probably are enjoying your lunch uh, while you're having this opportunity to learn from a real expert that we have with us. Uh, but before I begin the program of today, I want to tell you about our programs for next year or this fall in 2023. We already have them established and the theme will be on uh, international security. And this is an extremely important topic, uh, which of course I think we have not uh, emphasized enough or even thought enough about until maybe very recent months and, and certainly in this last year. Uh, but we will begin the program on September 13th and we'll have with us Dr. Chad Briggs, who is the Deputy Director of the Foreign uh, Institute uh, of the State Department. And he will be with us to talk about uh, this whole issue of what has happened with Russia's invasion uh, of the Ukraine and what we have learned from that in terms of the effects on international security. Uh, as we move along in the uh, fall, uh, we of course then will have a program in October and that particular program will uh, we'll sponsor with the uh, UW Institute and we'll talk about uh, the the uh, global uh, security implications of, uh, of, China, of international trade. And as we go on through the fall, uh, we'll have again the China Town Hall in November. And uh, then we skip December and January and come back in February for another uh, most interesting program. Uh, I want to call your particular attention to the one in March because the Emphasis there will be on lithium and international security. And I think that this will be something that most of us have had little uh, understanding about, but it's absolutely critical uh, as lithium is a mineral uh, that is uh, found in just certain parts of the world. Argentina and Chile and Bolivia have about 56% of the world's uh, lithium. And, uh, and it is of course the mineral that powers batteries that keep all of our laptops and cell phones and so forth operating. So the, uh, the presence of lithium and who has it and who can mine it uh, is extremely important in international security. And so we'll go on then with the rest of the uh, programs in the spring of next year. And I would call your attention to our website to please uh, take note of the website and you'll get more details about the programs. All of the programs will be in person beginning in September with the exception of the final program in May because the speaker will be in Hong Kong. And uh, so I want you to have these down in your calendar as soon as you note the dates from our website. And it will be really uh, another opportunity to be together again and have most interesting speakers enlighten us. Uh, I also want to call your attention now for today to the chat at the bottom of your screen to click on the chat if you have a question because at the end of Dr. Kurt's presentation, uh, he will take questions, of course, and uh, I'm sure that we will have a lot of questions. Uh, and it's really a very uh, unique uh, opportunity that we have to have Dr. Mamet Kurt with us. Dr. Kurt is a lecturer at Yale and he is also a global fellow at the London School of Economics. And he happens to be with us today from London. And so we appreciate the fact that we're able uh, to have him with us. He has very interesting research uh, and he focuses on the uh, political sociology and anthropology, uh, the intersection that they come, that they, where they come together uh, with regard to religion. And he is, uh, has particular uh, emphasis uh, on the whole issue of, uh, of Islam uh, and uh, civil society. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kurt published a most interesting book in 2017 uh, about the Kurdish situation, the, the Kurdish Hezbollah and uh, violence in Islam and the effect on the state. So if you're interested in more about uh, the Kurdish 
uh, people and their uh, uh, re and his research on them, I think that you would find this book very, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Kurt is now uh, doing research on um, transnationalism and, and mobilization of, of Turkish people. And he's really studying the effects of how they uh, keep their identity and, and ethnicity uh, as they move into Europe and the United States. So it sounds like we may have the topic of another book, uh, Dr. Kurt. So uh, without further ado, we want to hear him because he is going to be finishing our series on the rise of authoritarianism. And he will be talking about, of course, the rise of authoritarianism in Turkey. And so Dr. Kurt, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, for the nice introduction. And thank you very much for the uh, invitation. It's a true pleasure to be here speaking about Erdogan's Turkey. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the most recent last 20 years of Turkey in regards with the Islamist politics and mobilization. Um, I'm going to divide my talk into three sections. The first section, and relatively a shorter one, hopefully, uh, is going to be on the background of the Turkish Republic to provide some settings, how we arrived where we are at the moment. And then I will divide the AKP period, the Justice and Development Party, the current Islamist government of Turkey that has been ruling the country in the past 20 years into two periods. And I will highlight certain issues within these two periods, uh, including the democratization and uh, openings towards minorities, uh, ethnic religious minorities, the situation with the economy, uh, the changing uh, foreign relations from the first to the second period. I will put a specific emphasis on the Kurdish conflict and the implications of the Syrian war on Turkey's policies and regional position. And then, of course, I'll be speaking about the Arab Spring and the S Syrian civil war and the refugee crisis. And then I'll be talking about the situation of institutions, justice, religion, and the youth. Uh, of course, I won't be able to go into details with all these headlines, but I wanted to provide a broad overview of what is going on in Turkey rather than just uh, specifically focusing on my area of expertise. But I, I welcome uh, all questions and I'm happy to expand upon your questions uh, after I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. So, well, <clears throat> uh, in about a year, we will celebrate the 100th year of establishment of Turkish Republic. The Republic of Turkey uh, was established in 1923 as a Western facing country, a modern nation state based on the principles of the Western values and principles. Um, and of course, Turkish nationalism. So like every nation building process and project, basically Turkish Republic's project was also uh, quite problematic in terms of their treatment to minorities and so on. Yet, uh, because of the unique position of Turkey between West and East, and uh, because of its geopolitical importance, um, Turkey became an interesting case to look at among the Muslim majority countries in the Middle East. Between 1923 until, 19, uh, until 1950, basically Turkey was ruled by a one party system, something that we, we might have a difficulty to call a democracy. Uh, under the and, and a significant part of this was under the direct rule of the founding figure Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, who is the founder, but also he they created a cult around him. So, uh, of course, during the interwar period, Turkey went through a lot of difficulties and like the establishment of a modern nation state and dealing with the issues that uh, stem from the question, the Kurdish question and Kurdistan question to be more precise, because soon after the establishment of the Turkish Republic, there was a Kurdish national rebellion in 1925 
led by a Sufi Naqshbandi Kurdish Sheikh Said. Um, the rebellion, the uprising was uh, suppressed in a few weeks, but it provided a blueprint for the new administration, Ankara government, to basically uh, rule the country single-handedly. Uh, so emergency laws, martial laws, and emergency decrees were introduced, special administrations were established, the population exchanges um, took place. Uh, many Kurds and many Kurdish Alevis have suffered during this, this period, as well as, of course, the Greek Orthodox people, the Jews, and, of course, in 1925, the Armenian genocide. Um, so in 1950, Turkey went into a multi-party system. And of course, until 1950, basically, Turkey had a strict administration and understanding of a separation of religion and politics. Yet their intention and their plan was not a complete separation, but rather to put religion and religious institutions under control of the state. And in this period, of course, many policies were introduced, many mosques were closed down, and most of the conservative practicing Muslims of Anatolia were alienated. Um, this um, situation created um, a lot of sentiments which served as the base of the Islamist mobilization that would, took place, uh, that would take place uh, beginning from 1970s. So, in the 1970s, what we see in Turkey is a polar, polarization of the West and, uh, sorry, the left and right wing conflict, especially between the student organizations and groups, uh, which resulted in the 1980 military coup and a new contribution, a new constitution that has been uh, in place since 1982. So this is a, an important turning point in the history of Turkey because um, I mean, in the broader sense also, we can think this in terms of the Cold War and uh, kind of the polarization of the world between the Soviet and the Western bloc and uh, all implications that come with it. Um, 1982 military coup basically uh, introduced a favoritism towards religion, religious institutions uh, as, um, as a way to prevent the influence of left-wing movements and organizations on people. So uh, with the 1982 constitution, compulsory religion classes were introduced. Uh, the state have opened new religious high schools, Imam Hatib schools, similar to Catholic schools. Um, and of course, the administration, the Directorate of Religious Affairs, which was founded in 1924, have gained uh, an, uh, a great influence and importance with the strategies to build more and more mosques around the country. Uh, favoring religious organizations against the left-wing mov movements, of course, came with, with a cost similar to the processes that we could observe actually in the 1950s and 60s in Iran. Um, and in the 1990s, uh, an Islamist political party, which was founded in which was founded in 1972, um, and the current Islamist government actually, like most of the leaders, come from that that background. But in the 1990s, an Islamist party uh, became a part of a coalition government, so the Welfare Party. Uh, this basically like kind of accumulated the power of the Islamist politics in the country, although before 1980 military coup an Islamist uh, political party, president of the welfare party, took part in a coalition government which lasted a few months. So it was the first time where the Isla an Islamist political party led uh, the main coalition, the main government in, in the Turkish assembly. Uh, yet, um, this coalition government and the Islamist politics introduced by the leadership of the political party created a lot of sentiments and concerns, especially among the military elites and the Kemalist uh, administer, ad, administration of the country and institutions. So in 28 February 1996, they, the military introduced a military memorandum uh, and new measures to prevent the graduates of the religious high schools to go to liberal arts schools, but just uh, 
they were obliged to go to theology schools. Um, as a result of the memorandum, the government collapsed soon after and Turkey were basically ruled by weak coalition governments until 2002. Um, of course, 2001 financial crisis in Turkey brought uh, a more weakening situation for the coalition government which was a coalition between the left wing, uh, central right and nationalist party. And ideologically, they could not really, uh, could not have a coherence governmental, coherent governmentality. So in 2002, basically the current justice and development party was established and almost a year after that in the early election of 2003, in November, 2003, the current Islamist government came into power among the financial crisis, the weakening political parties and the conflict between the coalition uh, political parties. So this is the first part of my presentation. And now I will be speaking about the two periods of the AKP, Adalet ve Kalkınma Partisi, as it's called in Turkish, the AKP government. Um, So the first period of the AKP government is basically between 2002 and it lasts uh, with the Gezi Park movement in 2013. Uh, during this period, we see a relatively democratic um, government that wants to change many things in the country and introduce democratization packages and um, new openings towards ethnic and my, my, ethnic and religious minorities. So by openings, basically, um, they meant, so they call it achlum in Turkish, and they meant to basically kind of resolve the problems that have existed since the foundation of the Republic with the Kurds, uh, the most importantly, uh, in, in the country, and then the Alevis, so the non-Sunni, uh, a relatively more secular Alevi population, mostly Kurdish as well, as well as the Armenian, uh, uh, Armenian, uh, Jewish and Roma opening. So during this period, basically in the first few years of the AKP administration, what we see is that the leader of the political party, the MPs work toward establishing connections and dialogue with these groups and representations. Um, including uh, including uh, MPs with Armenian, Alevi, and liberal and leftist backgrounds in the Islamist politics. So the true nature of the AKP government during this period is kind of like a liberal conservative democracy. Um, so remind you that in 2001, Turkey went uh, into a severe uh, financial crisis, um, similar to what we observe in Argentina. And then uh, the, the coalition government before AKP basically had to invite the IMF to take uh, control of the economy and borrow money from them. And as a part of that, uh, Kemal Dervish from the World Bank uh, came and served as the finance minister of the country before the AKP. So many reformations that have been introduced by Kemal Dervish served uh, as, as a good ground for the AKP government to introduce their policies. Um, and of course, in this all takes in a post 9-11 environment when we see that basically there is a huge need for a Muslim democracy uh, and for a moderate Muslim administration, quote unquote. Uh, within, within this frame also we see increasing negotiations between Turkey and the European Union. So as a part of that in 2005, uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey started direct negotiations with the EU to become a full member. And this allowed Turkey to have the access to the EU's pre-accession program, which is called IPA. Um, as a part of that, around three and a half billion euros were uh, donated to Turkey, most of which, as I will explain later, 
have been dedicated to the Islamist mobilization and empowerment of Islamist civil society, which have which predated uh, pretty much the current government around Islamic circles and networks. But now they gained the legal aspect. Um, also, in the early administration of AKP, we see that the, uh, Turkey has deleted six zeros from the Turkish currency, and uh, they made some advances in terms of the financial improvements. Uh, thanks to the huge infrastructure pro projects and housing boom and bridges and airports that have also consumed and I kind of caused the, the collapse of the economy in later decade. The foreign relations and the foreign policy of the AKP government in the first period, in the first 10 years, was based on principles that was framed as zero problems with neighbors. Of course, this would change in the second period, and they would then uh, highlight the precious loneliness of Turkey because almost they had trouble with every neighbor they had from the regional and European or like global level. Um, as a part of the foreign relations and zero problems with the neighbors policy, basically AKP established networks and dialogues between their neighbors over issues that they could not resolve in the past due to land share, due to like, so the, they, they established committees with degrees over uh, with the intention to resolve the Cyprus issue. And also uh, they, they started negotiations with Syria, with Iraq, uh, with Iran uh, from, from the region. And in the broader sense, of course, Turkey is a member of NATO and they took, they took uh, an active role in uh, ISAF in Afghanistan, as well as uh, in this period, basically, like we see the intervention to Iraq and to Afghanistan and uh, Turkey, stands as an important ally as um, to, to the United States and the Western coalition. During the first 10 years, we see the AKP does not really have a huge, uh, a huge uh, public supporting ground. So they came into power because uh, among the financial crisis in 2002 and the weakening positions of the current political parties, and because of the election system, basically, they, they managed to gain a representation more than the votes they, they received. I don't want to go into details of that, but I'm happy to expand on this uh, if you require so. So in the first 10 years, we see like basically many alliances between the AKP administration and uh, several other groups, including, as I said, some uh, socialist leftist individuals. Uh, a huge support from liberals in the country, as well as establishment of new alliances with the other Islamist organizations who were active uh, separately from the Islamist politics, but they had their own agenda and mainly active through education. I'm talking about the, the Gulen movement, as it's called, a uh, follower of an Islamic preacher, Fethullah Gulen, who now resides in Pennsylvania in the past 20 something years. So through this alliances, basically AKP, um, were unable to replace the, the, the previous um, elites in, in the government, especially in the judiciary, in the military, and in the police, uh, in the police, in the police administration. However, this is not without a cost, as, we will, as, as I will explain later. But in the first 10 years, basically, we see that AKP is behaving quite carefully uh, until they kind of like accumulate their power and can manage to introduce their policies. <clears throat> Apologies. Among them, in 2007, we see a constitution crisis when the AKP wants to nominate uh, the former president of the country, Abdullah Gül, whose wife is a veiled woman and they had an ongoing cases with the European Courts of Human Rights. So uh, through fabricated cases, basically the Supreme Court of Turkey 
wanted to close down the AKP government as they closed down other Islamist political parties in the past, but every time when they did, basically the public supported them more and more and they came into power, empowered. And then, of course, there was like several cases um, in the military, uh, mainly called Ergenekon, Balios, and so on. So, uh, and AKP supporting media organizations started targeting basically the, the Kemalist elites in the military and uh, through their power and alliance with the Gulenists, they, they managed to eliminate many people in the judiciary in the system. Um, this basically, becomes a kind of a turning point in the AKP administration. And by 2011, um, the Arab Spring begins, and soon actually it turns into winter, but AKP government basically sees an opportunity in, in creating collaboration with Muslim Brotherhood influenced political parties in Egypt, in Tunisia, and other places, as well as in Syria. However, uh, as we all know, that like this influence and this connections, uh, this connections failed, uh, and the Arab Spring turned into a radical wave where we see more radical Islamist and Salafi organizations taking over introducing conservative uh, top-down governmentalities and policy policies where they came into power resulting in military coups as in as in Egypt um, and in Syria of course Turkey was quite confident that they can take over Damascus and like this is a famous quote when Erdogan said that if we intend to go into Damascus, we will pray there. We will, we will be ready to take over Damascus for Friday congregation. And of course, this was like um, a really bad estimation uh, as we see that the situation in Syria was not a matter of week, but in the last 10 years, it is still going on. So in 2011 and 12, basically, there was also ongoing negotiations, peace negotiations between the government and the mainstream Kurdish political movement in Turkey, led by the armed PKK in the mountains and the legal political party, HDP, People's Democratic Party. Um, Although Turkey thought that Arab Spring could be an opportunity for them to kind of insert their influence um, to other governments, soon they found the problems in their house in 2013, when the government wanted to eradicate a small park located in central square of Taksim in Istanbul, Gezi Park, uh, which basically led to a nationwide protest across the country, people to, took up on the streets, occupied the parks, similar to Occupy movement in New York and elsewhere. And uh, the course of things, uh, the course of things changed quickly because the government thought that this is an attempt to overthrow them. And uh, the, the troubles that caused from this period still continue as more recently, for example, the Turkish court uh, sentenced uh, Osman Kavala, uh, philanthropist, uh, and 18 of his uh, companions who were active during the Gezi Park movement uh, with lifetime prison or 18 years in prison. So in 2013, basically, when the AKP noticed that there is a growing discontent uh, and, and protests, they started thinking, thinking of introducing more restrictive uh, authoritarian policies. Um, and this is also the year when the alliance between the powerful Gulenist organizations, who by then infiltrated especially the justice, military and police administration, uh, started to fall out. So the former allies became uh, true enemies in December 2013 when the Gulenist related connected uh, investigations from the judiciary and from the police revealed huge corruption that also connected uh, the president Erdogan's son and four of his ministers into this huge corruption allegations. 
In 2014, the course of things changed, especially thinking that at the beginning with the Syrian war, Turkey was in alliance in support of the a broader network, a broader coalition to end the Syrian conflict, but also prevent the Kurdish emancipation that was happening uh, or that was forming back then. But this is also a period when the Islamic State, the ISIS also emerge and take over quickly the land between Syria and Iraq. So at the beginning, when in 2015, for example, ISIS took over Mosul and uh, kidnapped the Turkish embassy workers and kept them for almost six weeks, the prime minister of the time, Ahmed Daudoğlu, just described these people some angry youths, but did not really take them seriously. But also, I think there was there was. Um, there was the confidence of Turkey that they could benefit from the presence of ISIS and allied organizations against the Kurdish emancipation in northern Syria. Although with the American training and the Gulf money and the space given space given by the <clears throat> by the Turkish by the Turkish government. Um, so many organizations, armed organizations, Islamist organiza organizations and individuals, um, basically, they were trained in Turkey to kind of intervene the political conflict in Syria in favor of the Western Bloc. Uh, I'm happy to go into details of that. But this did not work out because most of the people who were trained later on and soon after either were eliminated or forced or voluntarily uh, joined uh, more and more radical organizations such as Al Nusra or ISIS. Um, and this is the period when ISIS was gaining more and more power until October 2014, when ISIS basically surrounded, surrendered uh, a small northern Syrian Kurdish town of Kobani uh, bordered with Turkey. <clears throat> So during this period, basically, the armed Turkish, the armed Kurdish units from Syria and from Turkey resisted against ISIS. And it was a turning point also for the American administration to see that actually the Kurds are the only, uh, the, the only power that could resist against the increasing threat of Islamist radicalism and Salafi extremism. Uh, however, Turkey was not happy because the Kurdish emancipation in northern Syria was led by a group, by an organization that Turkey was in negotiation to resolve the Kurdish question, but have been in a fight, a low-key war uh, since 1984, and which caused 60,000 lives of civilians, mostly Kurds, and displacement of 3,000 villages and around 4 million Kurdish people in the 1990s. So uh, basically uh, negotiating with the PKK, why PKK is leading a revolution in Syria was not something that Turkey desired. How, however, the Kurdish emancipation and the Kurdish resistance against ISIS received more and more attention from the international world until a point that the United States led the international coalitions uh, decided to support uh, the Kurdish units against ISIS uh, through uh, weapons, through training, and so on and so on. Um, in October 2014, of course, uh, there was huge protests in Turkey in support of in support of the Kurdish uh, resistance taking place in Kobani, and Turkey lost control over certain territories, uh, international roads, and the majority of Kurdish region. Uh, for almost a week, uh, which became a very important turning point uh, for the following years. So among all this crisis, basically in 2015, Turkey had a general election in June, in 7th of June. And for the first time, so there is a 10% threshold for the, for, for the political parties to gain representation in the Turkish assembly nationwide 10% nationwide threshold. And uh, it was introduced after 1980 military coup to prevent the Kurdish uh, constituencies basically to gain representation in the assembly. 
but the pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party in, two, in June 2015 managed to get 13% of all votes in the country, which resulted in the prevention of the AKP government to form one party government. So they were uh, constitutionally forced to create a coalition government. However, uh, the Islamist government of Turkey did not want to do that. And they basically forced for a rigged election for a re-election in 1st of November, 2015. So between June and November, basically what the AKP did was to break the alliance with the Kurdish political party. And they introduced more and more violent uh, nationalist uh, policies and practices to consolidate their power among the nationalist voters. What happened was that basically they created these settings and situations where uh, the Kurdish youth were manipulated and had to take up arms in the cities, which resulted in the destruction of several Kurdish towns uh, and the curfews introduced in the Kur Kurdish urban center, uh, urban centers, 17 of urban centers. Some of them were totally leveled down in the process up to like four or five months like curfews. Uh, so around 2000 civilians lost their life in this process. And amid this, basically Turkey went to a re-election forming a nationalist alliance with the fascist far-right political party, the Nationalist Movement Party, which is still a part of the coalition, the broader coalition. Um, <clears throat> and they succeeded because of all the investment and support they put into all uh, the election process, the electoral policy. So after November, uh, 2015, we see uh, many situations changing and uh, AKP is like basically introducing very nationalist rigid, rigid policies, uh, quite violent practices in the Kurdish region. Uh, and in the following in the following six, seven months until July 2016, Turkey, especially the Kurdish region was uh, going through this term turmoil. And in July 15, 2016, there was a failed military coup led by the Gulenists and the former Kemalist elit elitists uh, within the military. They failed, but it caused the loss of 2051 lives. Uh, and the following day, basically, the AKP started consolidating its power. Uh, through emergency decrees and declaring a martial law that was in place until late 2018 in, in nationwide uh, martial law. Uh, it was ended, uh, but in the Kurdish region, it still continues. So there is a regional car, uh, a martial law and the elimination of the elected Kurdish mayors that is still in place. Um, of course, the second period of AKP financially uh, is is, is quite a weak period, but at the same time, we see a huge increase in the export to African countries and uh, their increasing relations with some of the Gulf countries, especially Qatar. But then, like in terms of their foreign relations, we see that Turkey basically uh, stays at odds with the European Union, the negotiation, the full membership negotiation fails. Uh, the disputes with the American administration over, over Syria and the support to the Kurds, uh, the crisis within NATO um, and the Western Bloc. And of course, after downing the Russian aircraft in 2015, Turkey uh, went into an interesting relation with Russia, which resulted in the purchase of S-400s. And uh, this also created a huge issue within NATO, of course, because, uh, because of the high technology used there and, and uh, the NATO's priorities, especially in the region. Um, also, we see that in the second period of the AKP, there is a war economy. So Turkey developed this drone technology that I think is now like one of the top countries in the world. And also they started to get involved in the regional conflicts, uh, not only in the Middle East, but also as far as North Africa or uh, some part of Africa as well, Eastern Africa through commerce and so on and so on, but also Azerbaijan and Yemen and, uh, and Libya, uh, 
and of course, most importantly, Syria and Iraq. Um, after the Syrian, the Syrian war, basically around four or five million Syrian refugees arrived, at the, uh, arrived in Turkey. Turkey shared the longest border with Syria. Um, so, and of course, with the refugee crisis and hundreds of thousands of people basically flooding into European countries, United States and Turkey signed an EU deal where Turkey would receive billion, I think around like six, seven billion euros to keep the refugees in the country. Um, of course, they did not really use all this money for the refugees, but they kind of like, you know, uh, channeled this money to the Islamist organizations, especially Islamist humanitarian organizations to consolidate their base and mobilize their uh, mobilize the masses. Um, so within that, I think the relations with the, like previously Turkey was considered considered as a strategic ally with the Western bloc because of the NATO membership, the geopolitical position and so on and so on. And especially the first period of the AKP administration was quite optimistic in terms of the Muslim democracies and the democratization processes that, um, that ended abruptly in the following years. Um, so the relations with the United States, with the European countries, and especially with the EU became more transactional based on the security, based on the refugee crisis. And this, of course, created a lot of hypocrisy, especially in relation to the ongoing Kurdish conflict, especially in 2015 and 16. The main authoritarian strategy of the AKP was basically to introduce these nationalist policies, uh, policies and inflict violence um, against, against the Kurds, um, which uh, basically resulted in stigmatization, discrimination, increasing racism in Turkish spaces for the Kurdish people. More recently, in the last summer, for example, like several, several people in, in, in the Turkish cities of Konya, Afyon, Ankara, Istanbul, Manisa, Izmir, were attacked by their Kurdish neighbors, whole families were killed and so on and so on. So in terms of the democratic progress, basically uh, Turkey is not in a good situation at the moment. And especially in, in relation to the Kurdish conflict, uh, Turkey has adopted increasing nationalist, Islamist, neo-Ottomanist policies. And of course, when I talk about neo-Ottomanism, uh, I should say that the Islamist government uh, of Turkey benefits from this Ottoman, the glorious or glorified Ottoman past to introduce some sort of like self-esteem and confidence to their constituencies and to mobilize their masses. How do they do it? They do it through soft power and culture industry. So a lot of Turkish TV series, periods, uh, the, the, the period series focusing on the Ottoman period is one of them. And uh, you might be surprised, but all around the world, people watch them and think that this was the Ottoman past and this is Turkey and so on and so on. And of course, another, Another medium for this strategy is Turkey's quest for the global Muslim leadership, uh, which uh, manifests itself through establishment of mosques all around the world. In the past 20 years, Turkey established around or maybe more than a thousand mosques all around the world, including Maryland, DC, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Cuba, Peru, uh, Benin, South Africa, uh, Central Asia, and so on. So next year is the 100th year anniversary of Turkey. And it is also uh, the time for the general election. Uh, currently, Turkey is going through a huge financial crisis. There are many issues within the government, between the power blocks, and Erdogan has a weakening position, but still he has the sole upper hand to control and manipulate the internal domestic dynamics, especially through, uh, through their, their powerful Islamist civil society base that's formed in the process in the past 20 years 
with the governmental funds, with the EU channeled funds and so on and so on. And another aspect is that Turkey has a very huge young population who have never really seen another government or another form of governmentality in the past 20 years. So I think the total population of the youth, the Gen Z in Turkey is one third of the whole population. And this, what these people see basically under the AKP government is that there are more mosques, there are more religious schools that people are not officially, but like kind of uh, through other means are obliged to attend. Um, new universities, so the quantity of universities were increased in the past 10, 15 years, almost doubled or tripled. Um, Whereas the young generations basically go to this schools, newly established universities, uh, populated by ideologized, politicized academic staff who are not well qualified to teach wide range of courses, but who are a true supporter of the AKP government. And of course, the housing issue for the students, for the young generations is resolved through the dormitories managed and ruled and opened by, by the Islamist civil society organizations in support of the AKP government. So in this environment, of course, it becomes very curious where Turkey is leading to in its 100th anniversary and in next year's election. Uh, I think that is all I want to say for the moment. Uh, I welcome all your questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Well, thank you very much. And we do have a first question for you. Uh, and it's, the question is now that Israel is forming relations with uh, several of the Gulf oil states, will this make it easier for life in Turkey or more difficult? I mean, Turkey, of course, has a very uh, fluctuating relations with Israel. On one hand, Tur the, the current Islamist government inflicts anti-Semitic uh, sentiments in the country and adopts discourses that, that uh, uh, basically is for consolidating the Islamist voters rather than implications of re real relations with Israel and so on. Um, yes, more recently, Israel has started establishing these connections with the Gulf state. And I think this puts Turkey in a difficult situation because in the last 10 years, Turkey, from the zero problems with neighbors policy to the precious loneliness, uh, became quite lo lonely. And especially among the Gulf states, it was only Qatar supporting Turkey in the past six, seven years. However, Turkey has... Uh, recently as a counter move, started establishing more and more connections with the Gulf states. More recently, Erdogan and some of his cabinet members basically visited Mecca during the holy month of Ramadan for an Umrah. But the true color of that was basically kind of to establish new connections um, after the Jamal Khashoggi murder by in, in, in the Saudi embassy. So, I think kind of Turkey is trying to circumvent um, uh, the influence of Israel in the region. But at the same time, I think the good relations between the Muslim majority countries and, and Israel um, makes it more difficult for Turkey to continue their uh, problematic discourse about Jews and anti-Semitism. Would you tell us a little bit about the president personally? Uh, we've heard about some of the, of course, uh, authoritarian people in other countries. Uh, what's his background? Uh, what uh, form of the uh, Islamic religion does he practice? Uh, is, has he always been a very religious person? Uh, sort of information about his family and so forth. Yeah, uh, sure. So Recep Tayyip Erdogan is originally from a small town in the northern Black Sea region. Uh, the whole region is usually known as quite nationalist, uh, patriotic people, conservative. Uh, he, was, uh, he was born and grew up in Istanbul uh, in a neighborhood, uh, uh, in a neighborhood called Kasım Pasha where during his high school years, he attended a religious high schools called Imam Hatib. And now they are investing a lot in, in Imam Hatib schools. Um, 
to raise, as once Erdogan described, pious generations. So uh, during his high school years, he got involved in the newly forming uh, Islamist politics, uh, especially in Istanbul, the nation, the national move, the national vision movement is called Milli Görüş. So the welfare party and the previous political parties stemmed from from this formation. So Erdogan was one of the people as youth leader in Istanbul, uh, quite active in the national vision movement in the 70s. And uh, in the 80s, of course, what we know about his family that he's married to, um, to Emine Erdogan, a woman from Kurdish majority region, but an Arab, uh, also uh, born and raised in Istanbul. He has several children. Uh, one of them was involved in this corruption allegation in 2013. Uh, in the 1990s, Erdogan basically, well, in the 80s, first he, um, he, he runs for an MP positions, but he cannot win. And in the 1991, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a bit later, he, become, he becomes the mayor of Istanbul. Uh, and this becomes a very important turning point in his political career because in his uh, mayorship in Istanbul, basically, he introduces several progressive policies, relatively speaking, and uh, receive a lot of support. And if Istanbul is, a, is the biggest city, city of Turkey uh, with a population around 20 million. Uh, so with the power uh, received from his position as the mayor of Istanbul, basically Erdogan, after the military memorandum in 1996 and the, the closure of the Islamist political party, do not become a member of the new Islamist party, but rather he leads a division uh, to establish a new political party. And at the beginning of his administration, they said that they resigned from their Islamist politics um, and they have another angle into what needs to be done in terms of the democratization of the country and freedoms and rights and so on and so on, uh, which also like received support from the liberals and leftist people in, in the first period of his administration. Um, so what we know about Erdogan that he likes uh, he likes to work with people uh, from his years as uh, uh, as an active member of the Islamist organization in Istanbul. He also works with his family members from the Black Sea region, especially like through finance and so on and so on. Although he comes from a very poor background, I think he is now one of the richest people in in Turkey. Uh, we never managed to know to what extent Erdogan owns uh, what, because it's not it's not quite, it's not very transparent. Um, but, however, especially with this political crisis, like all of these former allies and supporters and friends started abandoning him. So today, his former prime minister is leading a political party against him for the next year election. His former minister of finance is leading another political party against him for the next election. Uh, most of the liberals and a uh, small number of leftist people and MPs uh, in the former governments also are in a strong opposition against him. However, he's an opportunist, he's, um, he's quite utilitarian. And he manages to basically manipulate the weakening positions of other political parties and a kind of changing positions quite easily uh, from nationalist Islamist to more progressive and liberal strategies in the election, reason, re, um, election periods. So he has managed to stay in power until, until 2016. And to be honest, after 2016 November election, which uh, which was uh, which was a rigged election. I, after that, I don't see that Turkey is really going through like a democratic elections. Uh, it's quite problematic. So, which makes it quite curious. Which makes me quite curious what is going to happen next year because many people think that he will be eliminated through elections, but he holds uh, sole power over judiciary, over election processes, over security, over police, uh, over media. Um, so it might be difficult really kind of to navigate and uh, have a fair play.
in the next election. Well, he sounds like a survivor, that's for sure. Uh, the next question is, how has the Turkish government's relations with Russia changed over the last 20 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. I mean, Turkey, of course, is a part of the Western Bloc, and it's an important member of NATO, uh, which gives Turkey a very, uh, like, an upper hand in terms of their problematic policies in the region. Um, many things are kind of tolerated or overlooked because of because of the, the their position in NATO. Um, with Russia, well, Russia is a neighbor of Turkey, so they they. They previously, at the beginning, they had like more kind of like um, uh, business relations based on tourism because many Russians come to the the warmer coastal seas, uh, cities of Turkey in the Mediterranean, and also through agriculture and food. But they did not have a very strong military connection in the past. However, in two thousand and fifteen, like. Well, like begin, begin with the Syrian civil war, first of all, the, the Russians got involved in the Syrian conflict uh, by supporting the Assad regime, while Turkey was in support of what was called the opposition. Uh, in 2015, uh, Turkey basically attacked, down the Russian aircraft who was operating on the border area, which created a huge crisis. However, um, Turkey managed to kind of like uh, create a ground in which they became dependent on the Russian politics. I think this is one of the Putin's strategies. And uh, soon after they, uh, after the, the military coup in 2016, which Turkey officially does not admit, but like they use this discourse that it was the Americans, it was the United States that kind of uh, were involved in, in the military coup. So uh, in this process, it seems that they started having better relations with Russia because after the military coup, a new alliance was formed uh, between the ultranationalists, the Islamists, and some of the Russia supporting uh, small fractions, but quite powerful in the last 30, 40 years of the administration. What happened that uh, Turkey is now in a very fluctuating relations with Russia, because on one hand, uh, they want to maintain their position in NATO. And uh, of course, most of the trades happen between Turkey and Europe. So, uh, but on the other hand, also, I think they use this strategy against the Western coalition and Western bloc uh, to kind of implicate that Turkey is uh, is able to form new alliances, um, so which was uh, which was at some point a few years ago was sh the Shanghai Five's uh, new alliance between Russia and China and so on and so on. However, uh, in reality, although Turkey is using this strategies kind of like to empower their position and negotiations with the EU and the states. Uh, and Russia is benefiting from the, the problem, the, the controversial position of Turkey uh, by basically creating these divisions within NATO. So I would say that uh, Turkey, Russia relations in the past 20 years, but especially in the past 10 years have been based on the mutual benefits and strategies, but I don't think that this is, this is something that could last very long because Turkey from the beginning has been a Western facing country and trying to kind of be a part of the, the Western bloc. But at the same time, I mean, during crisis, second world war or like, you know, other periods, we see Turkey is trying to kind of have a more independent position by using its uh, geopolitical importance to get more leverage. Uh, you know, you've referenced some uh, judicial decisions that have been made. Is the uh, ju judiciary in uh, Turkey based on the Sharia law or is it based on 
uh, more Western uh, law or English common law? What is sort of the basis of the legal system? Yeah, no, uh, judiciary in Turkey, at least on paper, is quite secular. Um, so the, with the establishment of Turkey, they basically kind of like translated, adopted the Western laws. So the Swiss civil law, the French uh, notions of, of laicite, um, and so on and so on. But I think the in terms of in terms of the practices from the judiciary that most of the judges are now appointed by the Islamist government and some of them are like fierce radical <coughs> radical Islamists who would do anything for the advance of Islamist politics. So uh, it uh, although on paper the judiciary in Turkey is quite um, liberal, let's say. Uh, the true practice is not that much, but uh, it's, it's it's not based on Sharia. Some of the laws uh, are a little bit influenced by by some like you know uh, religious uh, norms. I would say around patriarchy, around abortion, about family, and so on and so on. But there isn't um, a Sharia-based court in Turkey. And I think only exception to that is that during the AKP period, the religious uh, organization, the religious administration of Dianet, the Directorate of Religious Affairs in Turkey, is now entitled to officiate marriages. Before that, it was only happening in the civil institutions, in the liberal institutions and municipalities. But now people can go and officiate their marriage in the Mufti office in the local branches of the Dianet. You know, in many countries, uh, social media has played a very big role, uh, particularly with uh, younger people in the population. Uh, what sort of role does that uh, play in Turkey? And does the government control uh, the social media there? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it's a very important medium. So with the traditional and conventional media organizations basically being shut down one by one by the AKP government or taken over by the Islamist organizations and individuals. Today, we cannot really talk about the freedom of expression or freedom of media in the country. It's not surprising that Turkey, I think, is still the biggest, uh, it's the, 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 the top country that imprisons journalists in the world, even before China. Uh, at some point, it was after China on the second, but uh, I think now it is the first. So social media becomes a very important uh, platform for the opposition, for the young generations to express themselves. And at the beginning, during the Gezi, Pas the Gezi Park movement, the Gezi Park protest in 2013, the government did not have the frames and institutions and the armies of trolls uh, who work for the government on social media. Um, but in 2013, with the Gezi Park movement, basically government realized that uh, freedom in social media is not good for them because many people organized uh, via social media accounts and uh, it was hard for the government to suppress it all. So what they did basically after the constitutional change in 2017, they introduced new, this new institution, the the president, the, the presidency of communication or something. But the true nature of this organization is basically it works under Erdogan and what they do is like basically controlling social media. Uh, so, uh, and several other like government related or government funded organizations and journalists also are leading this like armies of people who would just like support a hashtag on Twitter to kind of like create an influence and suppress other discourses. And at the same time, of course, so many people, so, so many people have been imprisoned, uh, detained, arrested, tortured because of a tweet or retweet. So just to give a small example, uh, I'm a filmmaker. I mean, I'm an academic, but I also make documentary films. 
And in 2019, during the editing uh, process of my documentary film, The Seven Doors, uh, we were in the production company and our editor was working on the film. The door was knocked by someone. The secretary went to open and she came like, you know, kind of turned white. She said the police is at the door. So I opened the door and like, you know, it's like around 10, 15 police, like all with this like heavy armories and stuff came in and they asked for the editor. Uh, so of course, surprised, I didn't know what was going on. And well, my editor of the film basically were put in prison because he retweeted two messages from someone that was criticizing the government about their violent activities during the urban conflict in the Kurdish cities in 2015 and 16. So these two retweets basically caused the six month imprisonment of my editor and still, I think his case is continuing, is still going on, but he's released at the moment, but he might be put in prison back after the final decision is out. Um, so this is just one example, but because of chanting a slogan or because of like uh, sharing something on Twitter or on Facebook, many people basically have been have been imprisoned. And also the supporter of the government are trained to complain about the content of other tweets by tagging the police and the intelligence administration. So these people can be taken care of. Um, I needless to say that in the past 10 years, 70,000 Kurdish students because of their discontent, because of tweets or their media releases have been imprisoned, served time in prison, detained, tortured, discriminated against. So I think this kind of explains what is the situation in social media. I used to be active. I used to be quite vocal uh, in my social media accounts, but after seeing that, I mean, sharing something for maybe two, 300 followers of mine will cause me some time in prison. I didn't feel safe. So I think self-censorship is another thing because many people either use fake account and uh, VPNs to be able to say something, or if you are there with your true name, uh, then you need to take the risk if you want to do something. You speak of all of these people who have been imprisoned uh, and you just mentioned the 70,000 students, uh, what, what sort of terms of, do they get in prison? Do they get one year or, you know, 20 years or, or what? Uh, I mean, uh, imprisoning so many people, uh, you know, is a, also a financial burden on the state to keep up these people in prison. Uh, I don't know to what degree they actually do in Turkey, but uh, I'm just curious, are these uh, terms that are very light or what, what are they like? Um, well, I worked in a Turkish university at the time when all these things were happening. And I was in the administration of the human rights organization. And I, to give an example, I, I want to just mention a student of mine who participated in a protest to protest the the uh, basically like the, the Turkish military burned over a hundred people in three basements in the town of Gizre in the Kurdish region in 2015. And she participated in a protest uh, media release, chant a slogan, and they arrested her and they put her in prison for four years. Um, so there are several articles in place to kind of provide impunity for the perpetrators of the fascist, um, nationalist, Turkish supremacist attacks, um, like insulting the flag, insulting the state, insulting the founders, insulting the president, uh, could be punished from six months to four years. So this is one of them. Freedom of expression is usually curtailed by an article 301, which is an infamous article, basically many intellectuals, writers, including the Nobel Prize winner or Hampamut novelist has been uh, punished with. 
based on the allegations, usually like what they do against the Kurdish, uh, Kurdish citizens, they would like basically create fabricated evidence. or so they would say that like, you know, through your explanation or through your media release, you praised the terrors and terrorism and uh, you insulted public and so on and so on. And then I think like, you know, kind of the range for this kind of things could change because like if they include another article, for example, providing providing space to, to uh, or helping terrorism or whatever. So it's like all these discourses and rules like would increase the number of years served in prison. But usually, I mean, most of these students served between one year to four years in prison. And of course, more radicalized there. Are these some of the things that uh, are affecting uh, Turkey's uh, application to be a part of the European Union? Yeah, I think it's a fantasy now for Turkey. To be honest, uh, like, you know, in early 2000s, there was <clears throat> a likelihood of Turkey becoming a part of the EU and there was a democratization packages. So finally, there was some ideas to resolve the Kurdish question uh, to kind of like give them their basic civil rights about language usage about education about recognition of their towns names and so on and so on as well as the issues around Cyprus and so on um, however we are not there anymore because I mean both after the Syrian civil war things got super complicated and at uh, at this time, I think like EU is not very much considering any expansion. Uh, so from both sides, there isn't um, willingness, let's say, uh, to kind of advance the negotiations. So the idea in 2005 was basically open new articles and issues kind of to adjust the system of Turkey, judiciary, farming, fishing, uh, I don't know, youth policies, minority rights, and so on and so on, and adjust into European law so Turkey could be prepared. And by now, Turkey was expected to be a part of the EU. However, uh, after 2013, uh, things got complicated um, and several, several negotiation articles, including Cyprus, and Armenian genocide and the Kurdish questions and the right of Kurds and so on uh, were suspended because um, Turkey was unwilling to make any, any meaningful change in their constitution and in their law and as well as in their practices. So um, now it is a frozen process basically. As I said, Turkey-EU relations is now more transactional based on refugee deals and like kind of Turkey's geopolitical importance for security. In closing, one last question. Uh, give us your best guess of how uh, the election will go next year. Will uh, the president uh, stay in power? Or will he have to form a coalition? Or, or how do you think that will turn out? Yeah, I mean, the current polls show that he has a very weakening position, although like with the nationalist party, they cannot really get the majority. And of course, like when they changed the constitution to pres presidential system in 2017, they did not predict that things will turn against them. And now they do not have enough majority to change the rule. Uh, so before that, it was like, basically you could form a government with a less percentage, but now you need to get the 50% plus one uh, in, in the general elections. Um, currently, there are two political parties divided from the current government working against the government. Um, and several other political parties also like kind of forming and reforming from the nationalist and liberal political parties. Uh, it seems that there is some sort of coalition between the opposition, but the exception is that the opposition is in a very fragile situation because on one hand, the main opposition is led by the uh, Republican People's Party, CHP, which was founded by the Ataturk himself, so which is like kind of a liberal, left-leaning nationalist political party, I would say. Uh, 
And the second oppositional uh, party is uh, uh, the good party, E party, which was divided, like which was separated, I mean, which separated from the, the ultra-nationalist political party, the nationalist movement party, which supports the AKP. So among them now, they basically like separated, they support the opposition, but like this is quite nationalist and they are against any progressive policy that would allow Kurdish people for equal representation and civil rights, which makes it quite difficult for the vital uh, votes that would come from the Kurds and from the Kurdish political party. So I think if the opposition could get the backing of the Kurdish voters, uh, they have a big chance, but at the same time, uh, the current government works hard to criminalize the Kurdish political party and terrorize and like basically targeting the functioning body of the political party every other week, arresting the activists, the members, the leaders, the mayors, uh, remind you that the leader of the Kurdish political party, Selahattin Demirtas, is in prison since November 2016. Um, so I think in this dynamic, uh, the Kurds are going to be the kingmakers uh, in the next election if there will be a democratic election. Because uh, I mean, like, you know, I was working with the European Parliament MPs. Uh, for the election observations during 2015 and later, uh, I have observed uh, so many problems in the, in the implications of the voting day, especially in rural areas where the military is in control, where the village guards are forcing everyone to vote for the government and as well as like the government forms all these alliances with the smaller units to give them more positions, money or uh, share from, from, uh, from the governmental funds in return for the support. Um, it's hard to say anything. Uh, the AKP's position looks quite weak. Uh, everyone believes that, okay, this is their last term and they are not going to be able to do anything. But every time, every time this happens, uh, Erdogan uh, attacks Kurds, like either in Turkey or in Syria or in Iraq. Uh, what they did recently uh, was basically like, you know, initiating this huge military invasion through uh, Iraqi Kurdish territories to eliminate the PKK from the mountains. So it's like this discourse around terrorism, fighting terrorism, fighting against the PKK, uh, helps the government to kind of consolidate nationalist Islamist votes. Um, I don't know if it is going to work in the next election because uh, the financial situation, the economic crisis is quite terrible at the moment. It's like when I first arrived at Yale in 2011, one Turkish lira, one dollar worth at one and a half Turkish lira. Now it is 15. Turkish lira. So in the 10 years, basically, like the loss of the uh, value of the currency and uh, the related collapse of, 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 of economy in the country is creating a lot of problems. Um, I hope he, he loses, uh, but at the same time with the authoritarian governments, election could be just, I mean, like, you know, for many years we have seen Assad uh, winning 96% or Hosni Mubarak winning 91%. So in next year, if Erdogan wins, like if he gets like 87% of all votes, I wouldn't be surprised because it's, it's what it is. Dr. It's not Kirk, going to be good for representation, of course. Thank you so much. I think we will now be all watching the election next year. We'll be much more informed about how it's going to be and what to look for. So it's been very, very interesting to have you with us. And I think we've learned a lot of things we didn't know before. And so we do appreciate it. And uh, I guess we finished with all the questions. So we'll let you go and have your dinner. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Melanie. It was a true pleasure to talk in this platform. Uh, and I'm happy that um, 
what I shared is useful to look at Turkey in another angle. Very, very. Thanks again. Goodbye. Thank you. Ciao.